And then now you're doing the intro. He's got a point. He's got a See, point. I, yeah, it could be. Well. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. That's all I got this time. See, I'm not a professional. I don't have a studio. I got my kids like locked out of the bedroom. I got to push mute yeah. like Bender, constantly. You know me. Yeah. Yeah. You know I'm not a professional. <laughs> Here, we'll get some audio rolling. Can you guys hear that? Nice. Oh, Look at wow. that. Did you hear that? That's Look really at that. Nice. I didn't. I didn't know I could actually do that for the longest time. I, I just thought it didn't work. Turns out the volume was at zero. So that's what we do. <laughs> there are a lot of buttons on that thing. Watch it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, hey, everybody. Not a podcast. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, welcome everybody to uh, Bro Chat Volume Four. If you're uh, following on the Kodiak Shack podcast, we've got Rain and Bender here, and uh, we're we're all over the map. Rain is uh, he crossed the pond, uh, the bigger pond too. You got to specify nowadays because it's a big world out there. And then Bender sure. and I are yeah where we where we currently are. I'm uh, two flights down in the old C model, which is pretty sweet. I've been. Uh, the first day, it was supposed to be a torrential downpour. Turns out weather was wrong. Uh, and then today, Shocking. it was supposed to be uh, hailing, and <laughs> turns out they were wrong again. So uh, so they're, they're batting zero. Uh, what's that in baseball? The Mendoza line or something? Like below <laughs> like 200. Right. That's pretty much their uh, batting average. Uh, but they were wrong in the good way, I mean, right? At least it wasn't hailing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but we're all kind of like – uh, I, there was a lot of fog this morning and we were, we were all kind of like leaning towards like, all right, we're not going to fly. And then we, we stepped, I think an hour late and, uh, and then it was a beautiful clear day. So it worked out. That is better. That's the worst though. When you kind of get drug along, like, are we going to go? We're we not going to go like, let's just make a decision. But I would say it is worse when they are on the wrong side of the weather prediction that it's, Hey, it's supposed to be beautiful. And then it's hailing outside. So at least you got that for you and you yeah. knocked out two flights this weekend. So you're kind of being a little humble. So you managed to start four engines yeah. in a matter of like 24 hours. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a personal best yeah, and I, I yeah. hot pitted a lot. So, uh, but oh, yeah, they, yeah, <laughs> yeah, they was, I mean, I actually, in four days of work, I will fly three times, which is, uh, which is sadly kind of an outlier, but yeah, it was, it was good. Ground ops are, uh, they're minimal, you know, cause you don't have like all the avionics set up with all the like roots and steer points. There's, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's 11 steer points that wow. uh, you can have in like three pre plan wow. points. So, I mean, there's not a ton to like avionics wise look at, you know, you got to set up your. Oh, go ahead. But you have to start two engines. So that's, that's right. where you spend yeah. all your extra time is that second yeah. engine you're starting. And the crew chief helps me too. I'm like, all right, ready for flight controls. He's like, don't forget the other engine. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, single engine only. Don't worry about it. Yeah, that's all right. It's like uh, get to the end of the runway and then start the second one. Practice for the for the airlines, right? Because that's what they do, right? Just taxi one engine. Yeah. Yeah, you got to save that money. You got to save that money. Yeah. How were the How were the flights? They were chill. I mean, uh, I uh, humble brag, but I'm just repeating what I was told. But uh, my IP was like one of the better TR TR ones I've ever flown. I was like, wow, sick. <laughs> nice. yeah, yeah, he's been around for a minute, I'm so he's blowing smoke. But I appreciate it. So, but uh, but yeah, the ground just, ops were you just ran out of chalk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, you just run out Luckily, of chalk and then want to have. Hundred percent of my debriefs have been in the bar, so uh, so we're nailing that. So it's got to be all right today. I. Uh, because the first day was like, get to the airspace, do some hard turns. I've told them that I have, I've decided I'm just not going to pull a lot of G's in this airplane. Cause I, I don't know what is a over G pull and what is a normal pull. So I pull like six and a half and I'm like, no, I'll, I'll like raid around at some point. But at the beginning, I'm just not going to pull a lot of G's. <laughs> and then today it was all instruments. I did a high, uh, tack in. So the full penetration, mm. uh, and then. Uh, and like, so in the F-16, for everybody who doesn't know, who doesn't fly, so a normal instrument approach is like, for for at least fighters, is they give you a vector, so they tell you a heading and an altitude, and then you get guidance to fly to the runway. And that's 99.9% .9 of the time we fly an instrument approach. 
a full penetration approach is like start at 20,000 feet. I don't know, 180, 90 degrees off, whatever runway you're going to. And you like kind of arc around and you have to fly all these, you hit these gates, uh, like you're in star Fox or something, uh, to not get, uh, run into anything. And then you intercept your final, uh, guidance. So in the C model, they, as long as you're VFR, you'll really not use your HUD. You know, in the F-16, you like, oh, don't use your HUD, wink. Like, uh, <laughs> like legitimately, like, you actually don't use your HUD. Uh, so we're like, I'm like, nuggets down, staring in the cockpit, just like flying. And I'm like, flying down to MINS. I'm like, all right, approaching my TACAN MINS. And uh, they were low. It was 500 feet was the, the TACAN brought you down to. And he's like, all right, you break out. And I look out the window and I was like, Man, this tack end brings you in pretty low. Well, sure enough, we get on the ground. He's like, "You got pretty low on the tack end." So <laughs> I think I was a couple hundred feet low on the uh, the mins there, but but it was good. It all worked out. Couple hundred. Feet. Look at you now. That's <laughs> couple hundred feet. Yeah. 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 No Sixty-five percent deviation. You want, to be able to, yeah. <laughs> you want to be able to see the runway and land, you know? So those are just recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it turns out I looked out the window and I was like, God, all those, those farm buildings are in the way of the runway. I had to <laughs> climb back up. But <laughs> so, but yeah, it was, it was good. Good patterns. I did my first, I didn't realize it until I was literally in the touchdown phase and floating long of my aim point, uh, that I have not done a no flap since T 38. Oh yeah. And, uh, and I was like, gosh, that was like 12 years ago. Like it's been a minute. I didn't it think about out. that. Yeah, you got to like you have a flap handle now. Oh man, it's they they still will blow up on their own if you don't raise the switch. So I'm like, oh, just leave the switch down. But you yeah, know, that I, makes, I, I that the, makes the motto. Wait, do they yeah. auto go back down then when you slow down enough? I I think so. Well, that but sounds like know. automatic flaps yeah. to me. Is what that sounds like. Yeah. Right. That's, I mean, I then right. I would imagine you really get some nice maneuverability out of that when you get slow in the fight yeah yeah well there's the because the f-16 had the the alternate flaps extend right and some i remember b Corps students would forget that sometimes and then you get like a low speed warning horde when you get slow and so apparently i forgot what ip was telling me this a student has his like uh alternate flaps extended in the f-16 he's just ripping around and he's just got like the low speed like hey if you hear this tone this tone recover like knock the fight off and he's just fighting in the horn and everything you're like, good strong performance that's awesome <laughs> that reminds me of one of my b course uh fight mates i won't again we don't we don't go with names on this program except for every once in a while but we're gonna go Most no name time we do actually <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh but he like when we got our bfm like phase brief you know in the b course they were like hey as soon as you get you know like you can get to the horn and if you you know like fun out of it whatever you can continue to fight but if it's sustained horn then we're just going to knock off the fight and we'll like redo it again he translated that to be like if i knock off the fight and i'm not dead yet like in defense of bfm then i have won the fight so his no kidding he would fights on break like roll leagues level and then get to the horn as fast as he could and then knock the fight off thinking like that was winning the, the defense of bfm yeah he hooked that right and then they explained like no that's not the intent of your defensive right <laughs> I love the creativity uh, though. That's, yeah. that's hey, you want to win. rather impressive. Not yeah, not gonna work against a bad guy, but you know. Yeah. That's it's, see at some point there's just the gamesmanship where you're like, I don't know if we're meeting the intent anymore. Yeah. Well, yeah, because like wasn't it like IFF and then probably the B course, like well, I guess everything is like survive, you know, for defensive BFM. So technically yeah. he did survive. Five all the way to the knock it off, but it's just not going to work in real life. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which there's there's a lot of uh, BFM that may uh, work exactly that way. Like there's there's modified, I don't know, threats. I won't get into it because I'm new to it and I'm not going to complain. About <laughs> <it. But laughs> yeah. So, uh, Rain, you just uh, are you well rested after your? Uh, over 14 hour flight, which uh, cannot yeah. be the most enjoyable thing. Well, you know, it's a trade off with the long flight versus a short flight. And my definition of long versus short flight has drastically changed over the years where, you know, I was good for like a 17 minute flight back in the day. Now it's 14 hours. 
For those 14 hour <laughs> flights, you do get to sleep a little bit, which is kind of nice. But it starts getting pretty trippy because right now I'm in Japan, so I'm in the future. I would tell you guys what it's like, but I don't want to spoil anything. Uh, It gets really weird trying to balance schedules on the road and doing interviews and things like that when you're like, well, right now, like it's Monday morning at 8.14 in Japan. I don't even know what time it is in California, but I know, again, you guys are way back in in the past. So, (laughs) yeah, uh, yeah. It's it's a different world. Yeah. Yeah. What stocks should we buy? What was, uh, that's the real question. Yeah. Yeah, or, I can't. I think that's insider trading. I'll tell you after we get off this. That way it's yeah. not documented. <laughs> yeah. yeah, what are those winning, winning uh, yeah, lotto, lotto numbers? numbers? Somebody told yeah, me it worked. 1.9 billion? That's crazy. Yeah. It's. I mean, it's a big time to be in the future because we got the elections coming up. Uh, yeah. That's the lottery. Right. I mean, I'm kind of a guy who's in the know. So. That's right, yeah. Just saying. Everybody's l- listened to this after the fact. They're going to miss out. Yeah. That's the sad part. I mean, you're listening to this five days after we recorded it, but you just know I'm, I'm in the future. <laughs> What's uh, so longest sorties before you joined uh, the uh, airlines? I don't think I have one that's that impressive because I didn't do a long, like pond crossing AOS movement. I did Dubai to Spangdalem, which was probably eight hours. Eight and a half hours. I did an eight-hour combat sortie. That was my longest sortie. But I didn't do any of these like crazy, you know, like, Masawa to wherever you guys went. You guys, yeah, I got me smoked on that. I think Bender and I were on the same. It, at least it was my longest sortie. I don't know if Bender had a longer one. But was it 12, point, uh, yeah, 12 and a half? 12 something. Something. And that was after yeah. delaying on the ground for two hours. So it was like in the seat for oh. almost 15 hours. Like, yeah. I could barely walk when I climbed down that ladder. Yeah, so on was. my 14 hour sortie, I did get two, three hour rest periods. Yeah. Um, um, and I could like stand up multiple times. What was your rest schedule on that sortie? Uh, yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I rested my eyes a couple, couple times, uh, <laughs> you know, set the, set the autopilot and the heading bug and, uh, and just hope I didn't get close to anyone. Well, one oh, of our man. buddies, I don't know if it was, it wasn't on this AOS, like a pond crossing or tra- traveling on cross, but one of the guys, he got tired of hearing us talking to each other on Ox. So he just like turned his radio all the way down. And so we're like, hey, do you think number, whatever he was, number five, like, is he okay? Like, does someone need to rejoin on him? And uh, sure enough, he just didn't want to listen to us. He was like, I'm <laughs> so over just people talking. Uh, yeah, that was... That was a long one. What was it? Uh, our squadron commander at the time, uh, Torch, I think he got the McKay trophy for like a 17 hour story. Something crazy. Like Hill to Afghanistan or something. Bender, do you remember? Uh, I know he got the McKay trophy. I didn't think it was for the duration. Maybe it was, though. I thought they went somewhere in the, in the sandbox to Afghanistan and then back. So it was like one of the longest that's strike missions in a fight or something. But. <clears throat> Yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, but he did he won yeah. he won the trophy. Which is pretty good. Were they were they out of B were they out of B twos that day? <laughs> yeah. Someone's gotta win the McKay understand. trophy. I think they mission plan specifically They're like, hey, all our submissions so far for this trophy are not that great. Somebody go fly seven hours, <laughs> drop some JDAM, and come back and we'll give you the trophy. Yeah. Like what? <laughs> yeah, I I don't know. Well, I talked to a B-52 pilot, and I think I'm probably screwing this up, but we'll call it truth. He said he flew like 32 hours or something crazy I've seen, uh, in the B-52. Yeah, I, so in some of the logbooks that I've seen in my day, there are some hot bomber yeah. guys with like 28-hour like like single sword emissions. I'm like, what the? Like, how is that? especially in the B2 when they're doing over 20 hours or whatever they're doing and they don't have, you know, like a backup pilot. It's just those two. I don't even think they, they might have a bunk or something back there, but. I don't think they do. I think they just have like a lawn chair and just a bucket of go pills. <laughs> yeah. I bet they get the good the stuff. Thing that would... Go pill wise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Like, they just get Straight like three go pills squished together. Yeah. The, uh, well, the thing that would piss me off is having to ha- wear like a fighter type helmet in one of those yes. airplanes. Like if yes. I'm going to, if I'm going to sit in like a B 52 or B two or something like 
just let me wear like some Bose noise canceling and chill out. Right. Like, don't make me wear like a face mask in a airplane that's made to be pressurized. And you know what I mean? I don't get it. I never took my helmet off flying no. like a seven hour combat sword. Never. Ever. I would never do that or think of like, doing that. So done with this right now. <laughs> With you got oh, access man. to earplugs, it's like your Bose headset right there. You're like, hold my helmet up and talk right now. I'm just not in the mood. I even like it's my so... last sorties in the F-16. Like as soon as I would land at Shaw, I would just take the thing off, like just taxiing back. And then, of course, the next pilot meeting, you're like, we've noticed people taxiing around without their helmets on. Like, <laughs> Please put them back on. Like, I don't know who you're talking about. Yeah, I would. I would wave at people. They'd be like seeing me taxi by, and I'm like, hey, what's up? Like, yeah, my helmet's off. I'd like it though. It was nice. It would be nice and cool, like especially night right. sorties, and you just feel like the nice, like cool cockpit air, you know. And you're like, man, okay, back back to work, you know. It's like yeah. can't get a 15 minute break. Yeah, um, especially when you're not even dropping that much. I mean, Rain, did you ever get a chance to uh, to clean your rails? Yeah, we did. I mean, it's quite a bit. Yeah, you know, like oh, you guys nice. really paved the way for us. And just set the good foundation because then it was like it was you know, like realize you're spoiled right you come back and you're like ah oh, i only dropped two bombs today i couldn't go supersonic <laughs> over raqqa because we do like kabani <laughs> and then the plan was to come back south like through the superpower lane as we started calling it you know right down the middle of syria and you would go supersonic over raqqa just to let them know we're coming for you and, but if you had bombs on the rails, like you couldn't do that. And usually then you, it was the penalty. You had to go back to Iraq, hit the tanker and drive all the way home. But if you like clean the rails and you did it at an appropriate time with your fuel state, just go supersonic on the way back home. Man. Sometimes like a JTAC up there, uh, well, again, we won't mention names, but I was fine with a guy, great individual. It was a relatively boring day. But he, no kidding, told the JTAC, we, we each drop one, and then we're, like, putzing around. And he goes, hey, we really want to go supersonic, but we got to get rid of these bombs. And, like, within about five minutes, he's like, hey, there are 100 fighters that just crossed the river, and they're in these three buildings. I want, you know, I want what six bombs. Odds? And you're like, yes, this is perfect. I assume there were a lot of fighters in those buildings, but it was just perfect timing to clean the rails so we go back supersonic, you know. Sometimes you just have to ask. Yeah. Yeah. That was our problem, apparently. Well, <laughs> all those stories. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. All, these, yeah, all these guys do these deployments. They don't drop a single bomb. Sometimes you just have to ask. See, I got I got in trouble for that. So my second deployment, I was a little more, I, I mean, Bender, you were there. So, but I was, I was definitely a little jaded, a little, uh, a little over it by the end of the first one. Cause it was, I mean, it was, it was cool. It was exciting to, to start doing combat sorties. And then night after night after night of doing nothing, I mean, I just I just sit there and be like, all right, I'm bored. And Bender, good on you. You were like, let's do work, you know, let's like find stuff. Let's and I just like try to get my targeting pod to like point at the moon so I could look <laughs> at the moon and stuff. And uh, just a complete waste of my time. But the reality was, it was I just I didn't have the right like mental like mind state or mental model however you want to look at it. So the second time I went I was like, "All right, like I'm I'm going to really be hungry. I'm going to I'm going to ask people, you know, like, "Hey, you need some help." So uh there was a period of time where their uh jets were doing DCA, so defensive counter air when Russia was in uh Syria. So we had Syria and Russians flying in Syria. And then ISIS is on the ground and the U.S. is fighting ISIS and Russia Russia is fighting ISIS. Um, but we have to do DCA just in case something goes sideways. So you're not dropping bombs. You're just doing air to air. And I'm capping over top while strike eagles are down below uh, dedicated to DCA. So what do I do? Or uh, CAS rather, so close air support. So I roll up their JTAC frequency and they get a 9-9. So I just follow along. So I like type in the coordinates and I'm like taking all the information down and they're like, all right, you know, read backs, read backs, line four and six. So line four and six would be like the, out, the elevation and then the coordinates. Uh, and like a long time goes by and they don't say anything. And the JTAC's like, Hey, you know, I think they were dude flight at the time. They're like, Hey dude flight, uh, you know, uh, let me know when you're ready to read back four and six. And they're like, okay, stand by. And then like another minute goes by and I'm like, hey, uh, whatever, you know, like weasel, 
one is ready to read back and he's like weasel this is not your frequency <laughs> so i had to leave but uh but i tried i did everything i could uh, thanks to the floor hey you know i wasn't, wasn't gonna miss out yeah you never know <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> you really don't yeah. there are a lot of good it dude did... flight stories in iraq and syria which i assume a yeah. big portion of your listener base might you know, be involved in those aircraft so <clears throat> I won't go into too many of them, but there, yep. needless to say, two people does not equal double the SA in an aircraft. So, it's usually a division. So. Yeah, it's like multiplying <laughs> fractions. That's right. So the number, the yeah. SA gets smaller. Well, Math. speaking of, this is a perfect segue. So uh, anybody who stays in uh, kind of paying attention to the aviation stuff, so the KC-46 just flew with one pilot. So theoretically... If our math is correct, that pilot had 100% of the SA uh, because he or she was alone. So, again, I've, I've only flown single-seat aircraft. I got my CTP, but that's not saying much. Uh, so what do you guys think having experience, like, actually flying crewed aircraft? What I mean, what does that say to you? Bender, do you want to start? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't be that single pilot for sure. Well, maybe I, I yes. mean, I think you could probably hack it, but who wants that responsibility? Like, I think know. it's one of those things too. It's obviously it's completely doable, but also I do have a few questions. Like having flown big old fat planes, uh, I would not be the one who was selected to go fly that single seat for sure. Like just based on lack of capability. So I'm sure there's someone out there who is well within the realm of their like capable capableness to go out there and do it. But it's like one of those like launch for survival. Okay, yep, I can go launch for survival and get this plane away from here and it's going to be fine. But if this is something that's going to become normal, and I don't want to be like the, rock, the guy on the front porch with the rocking chair saying this is impossible, but it seems like we're buying a lot of risks. Like flying these big planes, like a lot can go wrong. Like they're very reliable, but when it does go sideways, it's really nice to have at least one, if not two or three other people up there. Cause you're not flying this like you are a fighter. Like you're in two, like when you fly an Eagle, a lightning, a Viper, like you're in it and you're strapped into it. When you're flying these big old planes, vast majority of the time, it's just sitting there on autopilot, which is why they're, you know, going down this, this road and doing all this autonomy. But uh, it just seems like really out here on a limb, like what's the point? And I, I haven't read, and that's the other thing too. It's like, I haven't dug down into the whole reasoning of why they're doing it. I have some assumptions, which might not be in line with what a lot of people, uh, leadership thinks. But, you know, if, if it's a, hey, we need the capability to launch this thing in case a base gets attacked. Okay, I buy that. Like you can train someone like that's very, that's definitely in the realm of possible and, and makes sense. Like, Hey, you want to get this asset away from here, but it becomes like a normal operation thing. I think that's just a, a recipe for disaster with our current technology and what's currently available. Like the KC 46 is a seven, six, seven. That was a refueling platform in the civilian world that took 20 years to reach IOC in the air force plus or minus. So. That's my rant. Yeah, the other thing, what do you think, ben? I'm sure the again the technology is there, or whatever. I'm sure, um, but the for sure the like the infrastructure or the culture isn't there. If that makes sense. So like we go fly single yeah. seat, but there's three guys in the air with me. So there's a four ship or a two ship, and we know how to talk to each other in certain ways to be helpful to the other aircraft. You know what I mean? And then there's softs that are trained specifically to deal with fighters, you know, there's all that infrastructure behind the scenes that makes it so that a single seat fighter can, you know, minimize the risk of there just being one pilot. In the KC-46, like he doesn't have a wingman. He, I mean, yeah. I don't know what the cockpit looks like, but my guess is that not every switch that he might need to hit is sitting in front of him. It's probably, and I guarantee you, they don't have like HOTAS, at least not like a, you know, developed HOTAS like we would be used to. And I just don't, I can't, even approach understanding like what is the like what is the benefit like what are we trying to like is it take yeah. a lot of time to get two people to run out to a kc46 to launch to survival like versus one you know like 
it's not hard. I've got to be careful what I say here, but you can get, I don't know. Anyway, to get two pilots into that airplane pretty quick seems like not, like that's not the obstacle (laughs) to their efficiency, you know? Right. Because, again, like the cost of like a pilot is cheap, especially compared, not like life-wise, right? But like we should have enough pilots to go out there and do this. So the question begs like, yeah, like why can't we, we did, we've done it for 70 years with alert crews and things like that to, to get these people to planes. So like, do we really need to be able to do it? But the ergonomics of it, I think that's a great point. You know, the Airbus, the 350 freighter, Airbus is, you know, touting that as the first single pilot airliner, you know, that's going to come out. I think it's 2026 is what they're saying, but I would imagine that is going to, it will have the ergonomics to support one pilot in the seat that can get to everything they need to get to. And like, while you can reach the hand, the gear handle in a triple seven, like one seat has to lean further than the other. And again, it's not like a deal breaker, but um, I would agree that the cockpit is probably not structured to have that. So kind of like what, like, what is the point? Like you're buying all this risk for what? And I'm not educated enough on it. So if someone out there is, yeah, please, Please chime in and tell me. Yeah. One thing I will say before giving my perspective and what I've seen is we have had a lot of feedback from people. You know, when I say stuff that's uh, like not exactly correct, people always kind of reach out and say like, hey, this is this is reality, yeah. which I'll, I'll correct something here in the future. But yeah, I've been I've been reading a little bit very, very briefly on it, but it sounds like they view it as needing to allocate one pilot into crew rest to fly lines is going to enable them to fly more aircraft. I think we almost always have more pilots available than aircraft available. So I don't get it, especially when there's load masters, boom operators. Like it's not where it's like a B1 becomes a single seat and it's just a pilot or a B2 is now a single. Like I get that. And I think you're exactly right. The, the, layout of the cockpit is not built to be single seat. One of the things I was reading the comments, which uh, sometimes there's gold in there. And in this case, uh, there (laughs) definitely was, uh, it was on LinkedIn about this article. Um, and one person, which I didn't even think about this, but he had a good perspective. He was like, what, how does the FAA feel? Cause apparently McConnell flew a plane like already, like I actually did this. And he's like, the FAA certified that, pilot and plane to fly not in accordance with its FAA requirements, you know, cause again, if I'm like in a jet and I don't have all my required stuff to fly, I can't, you know, you can't take a fighter into uh, reduced vertical separation minimums, RVSM. Uh, you job. just can't do that cause you don't meet the requirements. So now we're talking, uh, you know, did, did they just kind of, getting, you know, step on their themselves because they got ahead of themselves and did something that they probably shouldn't have. But I didn't even think about the FAA because I normally don't think about the FAA, but. Yeah, uh, that's that's a really good point because we talk about like ADSB. I think that was a big concern for the Air Force for a while. I don't even know what the final justification was, but you know, like the fact that everyone has to have ADSB bring the Air Force up to that level, uh, you know, and the fighter aircraft in particular. Uh, is, is there's some security things and a lot of challenges just just to make that happen. And then we talk about GPS and operating the national airspace system. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's interesting. I say it's interesting the fact that like I don't get, I don't get the point. Someone will will chime in with, I think you're just buying unnecessary risk. Uh, if you yeah. need, if we're worried about launching for survival, I, I go with Bender. Like we probably have two dudes sitting around the squadron that can do that. And if not, like, all right, yep. In the time of like a base attack, let's get this plane out of here. Go do it, and you'll figure it out. So that just yeah. seems like you don't even need the permission to do it. You just do it. Which maybe I'm wrong. Bender, back me up. But I think ADSB kind of just like went over, and we didn't do anything. <laughs> Cause like right now there's no, there's no transmit out, out of fighters currently. 
So you can fly with like a little Stratus puck, which looks like, a, I don't know, like a just a rectangular GPS puck that will is a G, uh, is a ADSB receiver. So you can see other people, but fighters still don't transmit. So I know there's like a plan for it, but I, I don't know what Rap, the reality is. I think Rapcon, at least at Shaw, like they were putting like an art, not an artificial, but like they would, they would artificially pump your feed, so to speak, out for the flight lead based on the squawk. But no one else is squawking in the four ship, so there's three other little metal objects flying at 400 knots that no one else sees. <laughs> they don't need to see that. They don't want to see that. No. 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 Especially because they're probably not within one nautical mile and a uh, hundred feet of number <laughs> one's altitude anyway, so it's just going to get people in trouble. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a recommendation only. Well, I, I want actually yeah. I wonder if that is true because there are people open source sharing um, F thirty fives flying around in Europe. You know, they always do the flight trackers, and it's usually only like the big old fat planes. I think one recently was drawing things in the sky around a Russian base or near Russian base. <laughs> Uh, kind of they had on F-35, so I imagine they're taking those squawks and pumping those into the system so that people can see them. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I need someone who's and smarter I, than me. Yeah. I think that was the plan to, like, root it through, pretty much, like, scrub it and then send it out, just just positional data or something like that. But even then, positional data, you know, of your fight is probably like, oh, well, that's – yeah. You know, not great, especially if like <laughs> somebody else is listening to like the radios, you know, and you're like, right. oh, I have the radios and I have the lines. This is suboptimal. Uh, yeah, one thing I said on a previous uh, podcast that I kind of just, I conflated two things that weren't exactly the same with uh, JADC2 and ABMS. Uh, and then I had one of our listeners who's awesome was like, hey, technically, uh, and I'm probably going to mess it up now, but JADC2 is like the overall, like the joint, pretty much like Link 16, like combat web. And then ABMS is like the Air Force's side of that, like replacing the air battle management in the Air, air Force. So that was just something that I was like, oh, I didn't know that. Because I was like, oh, there's the same thing, which, you know, effectively they're not. But. And I learned something. Look at that. I probably said it wrong again, and I'll get yeah. some more feedback. Got to get that feedback. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just That's waiting right. for it I appreciate to, it, to so. wow it. Like, when's the last time an Air Force program came out? And everybody was like, wow, like, that's amazing. It works just like they told us it was going to work. And we're floored. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, even our yeah. best, you know, obviously the F-35 did, you know, <laughs> didn't come out the shoot like that we're still like pedaling <laughs> our way to like you know legitimacy but <laughs> so it's funny chat c2 is going to come out and be like wait this is like a 30 year old this is basically link 16 and it probably isn't going to work very well You're like okay good i mean i go back to the old kc46 it's a known platform i wish i i need to figure out what the difference is between you know, the KC-46 platform and the civilian tankers that are doing contract. I imagine the whole the civilian ones have the boom operator. I think the, in the traditional spot, like in the back of the tail versus what KC-46, like the TV screen, I think I'm making this up, just pure assumptions here. So again, probably wrong. But again, like, well, like essentially a plane that's been around for three plus decades, two decades as a tanker, and we aren't quite wowed by its capability and performance. Like this one, this one should have been a freebie. This has been yeah. like a, here you go. It's amazing. It's not developing something completely from scratch, but you know, I digress. <laughs> no, I think that's the thing that's frustrating though, because if we try to do anything other than buy it exactly off the shelf, it takes decades. I mean, <laughs> right. Two, two examples that are like fresh in my mind are the E7. So the E7 is a wedge tail, which, uh, who makes it? Boeing? No. Boeing? It's not, it's not the, is it a 7.3 or is it a Gulfstream? No, it's huge. I mean, yeah, it's a, it's a is, big are, do Gulfstreams come in huge size? Uh, so. Yeah, they're, maybe it's an Airbus. I don't know. I'm not a, we were just talking about how I can't tell the difference between like, an A321 versus a 737. I'm like, 
No clue. Like, <laughs> I know what a, I know what a triple seven looks like, and it <laughs> yeah. took me a long time to figure that out. So <laughs> yeah, well the so the E three was awesome technology like over a decade ago. It has a ESA, so an electronically scanned array Sorry, radar. You said so E three. The E three is not ten years old, right? That's no, it's old. I mean, it was Australia had it. We're talking about the when... E seven right now. Oh yeah. 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 Sorry. Yeah, did Way I? Off. E3 is yeah, not Yeah, I'm like awesome. the E3. Like, Correct. Let's, yeah, get that record This straight. thing's amazing. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, let's fix that. So another correction Midnight. to my list. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what you hope for. The uh, But the E3 is uh, is older. It's the traditional AWACS that you would know, the big dome on top that rotates with a big radar, um, but it's old. I mean, it's they have block 30s and 40s apparently, and uh, the block 40s mainly control do like the kingpin and all that kind of control uh, downrange. So I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, but the E7 has been the newer variant of it um, for decades now and has an ESA radar, so it's wildly more capable. And the Air Force is just buying the exact off-the-shelf model without changing a thing. And and they're like, we may get, I forgot what year it was. It was like 2026 or something. They They'll get two tails. And then by like 2030 or 35, they'll get like four or six. But in, they're not changing a thing. This is like just a new old aircraft. And you're like, sweet. And then the Strike Eagle, or the not the Strike Eagle, but the F-15EX, I found this out the other day, which that may be in my future, is it's a Saudi F-15, just a new one. And, but again, exactly the same. Everything they bought. So it is not like, hey, we made it so it can like maneuver more because the Saudis want like a, a little more conservative flight control system. Nope. Everything just same, same. And so we're not we're not like upgrading it. What I found is it's effectively it's a it's just a new strike eagle. Like that's what it is. And I was like, well. Sure. Really? So it still has conformals and all that stuff, like so it's just a big old mama jama. Well, the first buy didn't even have the conformals in the purchase. So it won't have conformals uh, just because they didn't <laughs> buy them. Uh, but yeah, at some point it will effectively be the new Strike Eagle. And it's, I think it's 129s. Somebody told me they thought it was 229s. But but yeah, 129s would not be yeah, that. Be but really 229s, I mean, they're yeah. still, like I would prefer the 129. But I was I was hoping it would take like, what the Strike Eagle, you know, computing power used to be. And like, if nothing else, just have better computing power. But right. it doesn't sound like that's the case. But again, this could be more incorrect information from your friend Vader. So who knows? Yeah. You have to go to the meme pages because the meme pages will tell the that truth. That is where the truth is. Which I just found the, yeah. uh, what's the Intel one called? That one's hilarious. The Intel, oh, Intel chick, you know. Oh, know. the Intel chick? Oh. Yes. Oh, I'll have to find it. Searing, searing memes that are, <laughs> yeah, they're just, they're all, they're on point. And you're just like, yes. There's, I mean, the meme pages have a lot of truth there, you know? There's some that, you know, can fray and uh, get on the fringe there. But if we want to get a pulse of what's going on in the world, <laughs> the meme pages, that's. Oh, man. Yeah. They have been roasting senior leadership for a good two years now. And it's, I mean, aggressively so, to the point where I'm like, oof, like that may be a little too far even for me. <laughs> well, there's some like the ones for AETC that are just like, yeah, the gloves got ripped off and thrown away in the shredder years ago. The KC-46 is getting a little bit of heat, that's for sure, with the whole single pilot. I feel that's how I get most of my, my knowledge and everything I've talked about to this point is via the memes, but, um, yeah, it's spicy. Yeah. We should, uh, remember, we should learn uh, how to cut stuff into the podcast, like clips of things, because if we could bring that, that one video clip where it's like the, I don't know what, like they're probably Iranian, some Arab speaking, like talk show where they talk about the block plan at red flag, having the seed guys. up. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that. I need to you haven't seen that see one. That. Oh, oh man. That was, no. Well, Oh, no, no, no. I ha okay, yeah, where it's like completely just... <laughs> He's just laughing. Over the top, yes. Yeah, let's yes. cut to that. Let's cut to that meme. So if we do figure this out, we can put it in right now. 
Yeah, perfect. Yeah, we can do that. I I'll tell you what, Rain, your your editing chops are solid. The uh, the video you sent about me telling that that one story, and uh, and it had like night videos of vipers. I was like, man, that's way more impressive than just me telling a story. So I appreciate that. Yeah, well, you know, happy beer, happy to serve. I need to get so this because this is on your platform. If yeah. I get the raw ones, you know, we can do some of the, take some of these little snippets and throw in there. And I think, Bender, that is a great idea because I completely forgot. Like, that That one really went around from – there was a one also to uh, whatever World War II movie that has, like, Hitler who's just, like, losing his mind oh, yeah. in the in the briefing room. Like, there was good – there's good tanking plans on that. There's all sorts <laughs> of, like, just great – there's those memes. I don't even know if you call those memes. Some yeah, I don't know what you call those. Yeah. They're good, though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they and Bender, I remember that one where the guy has that really like raspy laugh and he's like almost missing teeth. I thought it was like a Spanish talk show or something. Yeah. But yeah that was, was that the one you're talking yeah, about? Yeah, that's the one. Just laugh. He was like, yeah, we put the raptors just, at 20 and they're like living their best life yeah. and the weasels are <laughs> in the four block. Yeah. yeah. Falling out of the sky. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, man. man. God. Yeah. <laughs> Which I, I feel like, well, actually the other day I was talking about doing TI above 30,000 feet in an F-16. And I was like, that's about as big of a waste of time as you can experience. Just, I mean, because you can't turn. I don't know. You can't do anything. It's like uh, having to go to the tanker in Iraq when you're like at 29,000 feet. And you're like, well, I'm in just men AB, out of men AB, so I don't smash the boom. And just back and forth, like, am I really like getting gas or am i just burning more gas i did have a really good experience tanking have you guys ever rejoined on a tanker that's refueling hornets uh yeah. oh no. I think so. yeah that oh, one with the basket it was, uh, no i don't think i actually have yeah yeah i had, had the basket and i didn't realize there were hornets on it like it was nighttime i was visual and i kept my radar locked but i was just rejoining and i mean i was screaming in there turns out the hornet flies slow uh, so I overshot like a big dog, but that was, yeah. That's, uh, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that, that they would, why, why can't they get gas at 310? That seems, I mean, it's, it's not like it's the A10, you know? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Right. It was like two, I think they're like a 280 or something there, which I mean, it's not crazy, but I wasn't anticipating that end game to have an extra 30 knots to get rid of. Is it not usually back it off a little bit, bring the things up out of the floor, you know, a little conservative, but. <laughs> I was not that night. Did you? Uh, yeah. We used to fly to the tanker in Iraq with. Uh, I think Jikdo started the game. Jikdo good. Oh, dropped the name there. Great dude. Uh, <laughs> but he'd be like, "Okay, <laughs> we'd set good. our. You could set a fuel flow, and then you'd start the rejoin to the tank. And yet, so we'd go to the opposite size of the fill container, and you'd be like, "Okay, <laughs> now set whatever it was going to be like forty two hundred or forty two hundred pounds per hour, or whatever." And then as soon as it was set, he'd say, "Fight on, fights on," and then we'd turn to the tanker and whoever. You couldn't touch the throttle or anything. You just had to use your best geometry to guess where the tanker was going to be at the time of the rejoin. And then whoever got to the boom first <laughs> got to take gas first and won the contest or whatever. Uh, it's good times. Oh. Oh, man. <laughs> it's those simple little games, you know, they, get, they, they keep you going and they all, often get lost. I only had one. Like, I remember it was a B1. We were coming out of Syria and I was with, I won't say his name, even though you already said a name, but. Um, I was leading to the tanker and it was all I had. I was just pure geometry, but like, like you could see the B1 and we're like, Hey, can we go first? Like, and then the radio crackled or broke up. And so I was like, well, I'm gonna take that as a yes. And so we just slipped in, but like, otherwise we've been there for like 30 minutes waiting for this B1 to get gas just so they could go home. Yeah. That's all they're doing. Well, probably 30 minutes for them to get the rejoin done. And then <laughs> yeah. another 30 for the gas truck. I read some article where it was yeah. talking about, I think it was talking about a C-17. And he's like, yeah, it usually takes us about 15 minutes to fill up. I'm like, that's not true. That can't possibly be true. Like, <laughs> even like <laughs> sitting on the wing watching Strike Eagles get gas, you're like 40 minutes later. You're like, holy crap, please, like, let me take some fuel. It's a lot of gas. Once well, we refueled behind some Emirati Vipers, so it was a four ship of Emiratis, and we were two miles and trailed them doing the strike. And number three couldn't get on the boom. 
and we were just looking like all right, we're about to roll like we rolled like Baghdad bingo, uh, you know, just trying to like hang out as long as we could. Those things take so much gas with that big old motor, and it's still, I mean, it just takes forever. It's like, dude, just give number four two thousand pounds, and then we'll get our gas, and then you guys can deal with this again. Like, we must, we must move along here. Yeah. Well, I heard uh, it was. I was showing up. There were uh, two strike eagles who there was like a thunderstorm over their base, so they were just sauntering. Um, which we showed up to the ATG just to saunter too, because we weren't going to do anything. And I was like, do you guys just want to saunter here and I can just go home? But, you know, so whatever. So they're like sauntering <laughs> like 30 miles in trail of me. Um, and they're like working, trying to get enough gas just to pretty much not weather divert. So they're like, hey, you know, we think the weather would be good enough to go home in about an hour. And they're like, all right, let us know how much you need uh, to meet, to like hang out for another hour. And they were like, Hey, 40 K should hold us over for another hour. And I was like, 40 K is like my entire formations offload for the night. Yeah. For and the night you know, we're getting three like, six, yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's like, we're, we're taking like maybe eight K, you know, each time we go. And so it's like, this is, this is crazy. Um, but they're like re-rolling tankers and stuff to, to like redo the gas plan, you know, cause an extra 40 K kind of throws that off. I remember one, uh, one night cause like your tanker doesn't always stay, you know, and especially at the beginning when Bender and I were there, tankers would like bounce. So they'd like give you gas. They'd fly across the country, give someone else gas and they'd come back. And so, uh, Bender knows who this is, but I won't say who it was. We like hop off the tanker and he's like set like 385 or something like airspeed. And I was, like, <laughs> and I'm looking at the gas plan and I'm like, okay, we cannot get gas early because the tanker is not there. So like this, this can't happen. So I'm like, mm -mm. so I'm like holding max Ender like 300 and you know, 10 knots or something. And I was like, okay, see ya. So I'm like. 40 miles in trail just like stripped and i'm like no nah, i'm not i'm not doing it well sure enough he like is he's like all right i'm gonna go to the tanker and he's like where's the tanker and i was like i think it went to this like other tanker track <laughs> and he's like what and i was like yeah on like the the like tanker flow it says they're on their way back from like this tanker track that's like 200 miles away uh and he's like well i'm gonna go now so he like meets him like 150 miles across iraq to get gas uh early and i was like well that's you know so it's i mean it gets it gets uh sporty sometimes yeah it was the wild Did west one of the, the, i mean we didn't even have like tanker frequencies so like you're trying to like it was just like <laughs> find someone somebody somewhere please give us some fuel yeah, you guys really ripped the band-aid off. Did you ever do a tanker turn on? Like where they do the turn? I've only done I only did this once. One time, yeah. yeah. And it was it was terrible. Like they needed to practice the turn. It's like sure. And then when they turned seven miles in front of us when they rolled out, we're like, This is gonna be painful as we run you guys down for the next like twenty minutes, just burning gas. Like, could you do some S turns or like some <laughs> ninety ninety left, ninety right, just to give us some distance? Yeah. Yeah, tankers I, they're great they're yeah. absolutely great but man sometimes really cause well, a lot I, of stress there's variability in like how quickly they start to turn because i would yeah. use like like roughly 13 ish miles like they would roll out right in front of you and uh so you'd be like hey start your turn now and then you'd watch them and like on your radar it's like just tracking forward and you're like oh no <laughs> like, <laughs> turn, turn, not turn. and because it's like when you say turn now it's like start like crack the wings and so even if it's like a two or three like two mile delay which when you're collapsing range at close to one and a half the speed of sound like it's happening fast and uh so yeah so there'd be times where it'd just be like this bomb burst at the tanker because everybody <laughs> goes like one person goes to one circle one person goes two circle but uh, yeah that was great that was coming out of uh uh kuwait I had one dude turn him and it was like 19 miles and he was like, yes, yeah, start your turn. And they did exactly what he asked him to. And I was like, we are like 11 miles in trail. <laughs> and, uh, it was, we, I was literally like checking my fuel and like checking my fuel gauge on like how much I can get home with. And we barely caught up and got gas before we could not make it back home. And I was not happy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this is a good thing to talk about fifth gen and why it's great. 
because non-combat tanking story, I was going to Heritage Flight out in Tucson. So the way we'd normally flow that is we'd meet up with the tanker over Nashville. And so on this day, I had a wingman as my safety observer. And then I think your former DO was going out as like leadership. It was the most beautiful day you've ever seen in your entire life. There's not a cloud in the sky. And we, the tanker is holding over the Nashville VOR. I go to rejoin. Number two goes blind, uh, you know, over, over the VOR. I have no idea where he is. I can't find him. Number three can't find him. The Raptors are coming in from Langley up high, and they're going to descend down and rejoin with us on the tanker. But it took the Raptors to find my wingman and then to, like, <laughs> get him a PAR back to the formation of, like, where we were and just, like, you know, five jets screaming over Nashville, taking up, like, 5,000 feet of altitude. I don't know if that – I think that's still Atlanta Center, you know, so they're still just, like – relatively busy with a lot of planes on the eastern seaboard but <laughs> you know made it happen yeah fifth gen just gonna they're, they're for to the clear same. these airways out for the next 15 minutes for us please <laughs> yeah i'm sorry we need a fifteen thousand foot altitude block over nashville now please yeah bender how are uh how are fifth gen only wingmen when they have to do visual type things uh, that's a good question that is a good question they're so I'll be honest, like fifth gen women, they're actually pretty good. Like it's fun to make fun of women. So that's my one caveat. Now I'm just going to make fun of women. The entire time. Uh, <laughs> but you would like, cause I think IFF, they went down the, the track of like, oh, fifth gen don't need IFF basically. Right. I, I don't know if that's like still the thing, but they were like, yeah, IFF principles, like they don't apply to fifth gen because you know, we never fight that close together. So I think some of them just went, you know, pilot training, just to the B course without ever doing IFF. Um, so anyway, which is funny because we do spend, I mean, the, the majority 40 minutes of your sortie is flying, you know, to and from the airspace, one mile visual, you know, to your, <laughs> to your flight. Lead. Right. So it turns out you actually do that quite a bit, but uh, it's uh, yeah, I've, I think my first couple of four ship rides in the T-38, we had some pretty heinous rejoins, but F-35 rejoins post-flight, like post-fighting, like after the knock it off, they are insane. They're so bad. It's just like, because everybody's like pretty lethal. We're really good at being like 10 miles from each each other and like flying really well. And then it's like, everybody's clear to join and there are just airplanes going everywhere. And you have to call like visual, you know, with, once you're within like five miles and 5,000 feet or whatever. So it's like three visual, two whatever blind on one or whatever two's visual one blind on three so like every day is like this it's just like and then eventually <laughs> they're just like circling over each other and they see everybody sees each other and then we finally get into visual formation but it's not the cleanest part of sorties generally <laughs> getting back into a visual formation luckily you've got plenty of gas to work that out lots of gas yep and it's also the some of the we've had we had some like the limex guys so they they go fly the viper for so they're women in the viper for like a year and then they come over to the f-35 they are or at least some of the funnier post fight flows if you will come from those guys who they know like what it should be like in like the fourth gen world but they they're not like used to being as autonomous as the fifth gen bubba's who like never ever look outside their airplane so like to have those guys we had one and he was just like it was his first sortie and he's like bingo like, cool. Like, in a fifth-gen wingman would just, like, go home. Most wingmen would at this point, like, once they're experienced. But this this guy was like, I said, bingo. Like, what should I do now? <laughs> we're like, copy. He's like, one. Two is bingo. I'm like, one copy is your bingo. Like, I didn't understand. Like, I, I have closed the loop. Like, what do you want me to do at this point? And then he just turned and followed me. And he's like, and then he's like, I'm bingo minus two. I'm like, okay. Like, obviously, like, we're not understanding what's happening here. So he like flew himself below, like well below the fuel because he was waiting for us to get back to visual and like to head back home together or whatever. And it was kind of funny. I'm like, how did you not understand? You know, like go home. Like if you don't have the gas, like go home. When most fifth gen wingmen, like <laughs> they're pretty good. Like they understand, I think, kind of how to make that happen. Tip. <laughs> That's good because, you know, I think 
you know, this is a spear that's, it's unwarranted, but it's happened a lot of times. Wingmen don't know how to take themselves home. So, you know, it may have been one of those things like, I didn't review how to get home because you're leading me. So I'm just going to wait, you know. I mean, I've been there before, like, no, nah, I'm not trying to leave right now. Like, <laughs> I got uh, yeah. my LAO at Nellis for a red flag was... I like reach out. Uh, I'm guest help with the uh, 55th and uh, a reservist that was out there. He's just about to retire. Really good dude. And I was like, Hey, where are the LAO slide just so I can review, you know, I've looked through the in-flight guide a little bit and he's like, don't worry. I'll tell you everything you need to know. Well, we didn't really brief because we were just chilling. We go out and we're red air and uh, we get shot. So he's like, all right, two, you're dead. You know, go ahead and spin back. Uh, and like the fight's ending. He's like, two, just go ahead and, you know, you can just go on home. I was like, I'm not doing that. Like I have attempted to learn the procedures and I still do not know them. So, uh, so as like, a, I think I was an IP at the time. I was like, mm -mm, like I am staying with you. So, uh, but yeah, it was good. Yeah. It all worked out. I'd rather run out of fuel than get <laughs> violated exiting this airspace. <laughs> well, especially to yeah. the, what is that? To the South, like as yeah. red air, you know, all those step downs, like mm -mm, not for me. Yeah, there's a few gotchas out there on that side of the airspace that, like, I don't know what happened to you, but it wouldn't be good. Yeah. Yeah, I would just it run would, out. I'd rather run out of fuel, too. <laughs> yeah. It would, or just, like, you know, land at 800 pounds and just, you know, don't don't worry about it, you know. But, yeah, that's, you know, hey, thanks for being guest help. You got our squadron in a lot of trouble. Like, that's not what you want from your <laughs> LEO. Yeah. Oh man, that was, I think the RTB, uh, rain, did you ever go to like uh red flag, Alaska? No, of course not. Cause I was Shaw. So, oh yeah, there were no good so, deals to be had. Yeah, I think that's... like red flag, Alaska popped up on the radar once and it was immediately changed to a coalition flag at Nellis. Yeah. Unbeautiful. Class flag. Yeah. <laughs> Unclass flags. Well, that's yeah. the way we want to be in life. Jab think... a pin in my eye. Yeah. Well, especially how frequently you would go to them, you know, like it's just, oh. it seemed like that was just nonstop, especially for the Shaw squadrons. You're the deployed or at Nellis. Well, it's like the best part. Like every, you know what the deployment cycle is. And then the welcome home is like two months of like reconstitution, get spun back up. And then we need a capstone large force exercise. So let's send you to an unclass flag. And it's just like every time I was just talking to an individual at one of your former places. Uh, and he said, like, guess what? We're slated for a deployment. And guess what we're slated for right when we come back? It's like a red flag. And you're like, first one's, first one's cool. Uh, second one, you're like, I just don't want to get hit by some name, country, whatever, that's going to go screaming through the altitude block in the middle of the night. And like, I was always, you know, it's being a W for a last name. It wasn't based on skill. They just forgot to put my puck somewhere. And so there would always be, oh, well, it was, rain's going to fly at night. So like, I didn't fly. I did not fly daytime red flag ever. I only flew nights. I saw Nellis during the day for the first time doing WIC support. <laughs> I never flew a daytime red flag. That's crazy. It was terrible. Yeah, the night, the night like, train is the good mm -hmm. train of like eventually – I don't know. It depends on what's going on. If I'm going to do an unclass, then I'm usually like, I'll do that. Right. I, I don't, I'd almost prefer to be on the night just because, well, the, like it, the tier one red flags at night are just like all the admin that comes with that. It's like, oh my gosh, it's painful. Yeah. But I guess it's nice in the sense of like usually nighttime red flag, it's usually the DO, the weapons officer. It was always a good group of people yeah. on the night train. Yeah. But. You know, once you do it like four times, you're like, okay, yeah. please, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I did the, uh, yeah, I even offered. So I go ahead there. Oh, I was just going to say, I offered to be, I was at McIntyre when we went to Red Flag and I was like, I'm happy to fly the night bulls. It was like a uh, U.S. only. And I was like, let's go. Like, let me, let me, you know, see the thing. And, and, uh, they were like, no, we're okay. Okay, I'll fly during the day. And then it turns out it was like heinous weather during the day too. So uh, what were you going to say, Bender? <laughs> uh, the last one I went to, I was, because I was guest help, well, I'm a reserve, so we're all kind of guest helpy. So they just like put you kind of where, they either treat you one of two ways. Either you're like the trash that they just spill in where they like forget to, you know, like do the stuff that they were supposed to do. So you're the backfill or 
this squadron was awesome. They were like, oh, like, thanks for coming out. We're going to treat you like you get first choice of everything. So it was me and a guy uh, who's awesome. He's a Navy Top Gun guy that joined our reserve unit. But they're like, what do you want to do? So we like picked our holes. We like picked when we wanted to be flight leads or whatever. And then the best part was they, uh, because we were late additions to the red flag, they did not, I don't know how this works, but it, to be able to get read into the ACC world of a tier one, you they have to like pay for the billets. You guys familiar with that? No. Oh, anyway, so they, they, Interesting. they didn't pay for the billet for me and this guy, but bottom line, because I guess there was a certain amount of spots. Um, so they're like, oh, like bummer, you don't, you're not going to be read in, so you can't do any of the mission planning. Uh, so you're just cleared off the days that you're not flying, and then we'll give you all our products. <laughs> yeah, when you fly, we'll just have it all ready for you, whatever. Anyway, it was the best red flag I've ever been to, for sure. Like, hey, that's <laughs> yeah, you can just. Yeah. Well, Sign the... me up. Bender, because you've been to, so you've been to both. I, I don't have as much experience at Nellis as, as you do, but in my experience, I feel like Nellis seems more congested. Like it seems like everybody's way closer together. Maybe it's Red Flag Alaska. I just didn't have as much SA, so I didn't realize how many people were there. Do you think Nellis just has more jets or less space? Oh, that's not good. He just hit, he just hit in. Uh, yeah. Alaska, there go. they've had like one or two... It's been a while, like mid airs, right? And there's one, I mean, it's out on YouTube, like two eagle. Was it? An, I know it was an eagle. I'm pretty sure it was an eagle coming back that had that mid air. I wonder, I don't even want to say it, but there has to have been a mid air at Nellis, I would think. There's some, I, I mean, there were close passes when the ones we went to, they were pretty, pretty. It's amazing it doesn't happen more often, I guess. You know, we talked about like the last one with, uh, like the mini blocks, we got like four jets separated by 500 feet at night. Like that's just get skosh. Bender's back, yeah. so this is good. I'm back. Yeah. Yeah. I lost your uh, the video yeah. froze you... for like the last five minutes. It's really awkward talking to two frozen individuals. <laughs> like, I don't know. Is this a funny <laughs> story? I can't tell. Like, I'm getting no feedback here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. But yeah, I was asking if you thought that the Nellis airspace seemed more congested than the J Park up in uh, definitely. Alaska. Do you yeah, think yeah, so yeah. or no? The J Park yeah. airspace is pretty full up. The limitations of the J Park range is the, awesome. I think the ranges are more limited. So like the stuff on the ground is more geographically limited. Whereas at Nellis, they have them like kind of everywhere. But the airspace is more limiting at Nellis. So that part's like less fun. Yeah. The cool part about like, especially doing seed in Alaska is that, you know, in, in the desert under the knitter, I mean, you look out the window and you're like a slab of concrete in the middle of the desert and you're like, oh, I found the surface air, you know, like missile site Right. where in Alaska, you like look out the window and it's just like rolling hills in like the Yukon tundra and you're like, this is awesome. And it's just like trees and you're like, Oh, it's going to be difficult to find them. Like, it's not going to be just a simple task. That was, that was one of my favorite parts. Like actually trying to find them on the ground was like, yeah, was I would, I would get pumped well, to go to a red flag Alaska. Like that's exciting. Like, yeah. Same. Yeah. That sounds nice. Cause I was just thinking like red flag, not like what well, you said, especially at night, because the emitters have a light on it. I'm trying to remember, like, it's a specific light. So talk about gamesmanship of just, like, <laughs> defensive BFM, just get to the horn as fast as possible. Like, I'm just going to look outside <laughs> with my laser beam, just slew the targeting pod to it. and like, oh, look what I found. Yeah, that's... Yeah. Uh, we never had night bulls at, uh, in a Red Flag, Alaska, because it turns out it's in the summer, and yeah. the sun doesn't set. That is, so that is true. We really could have bulls all the time. But, yeah, that's... Uh, which is... is it's crazy. It's cool that you get to do these red flags. How, like you said, like it's amazing that there aren't more midairs. There aren't more crazy things with people with real bombs, people with simulated bombs, real people on the range, like manning equipment. And you're like, this is, you know, you kind of have a good, healthy respect for like everybody needs to do their job or this could go sideways. That is a good point because it is impressive when you really think about the amount of iron that's getting put up into the air going same way same day 
doing a mission, doing multiple mission sets inside of there in a relatively confined piece of sky, you know, we were talking about that much flying around. It is pretty impressive. Yeah. So look, that was, right, a, that was, that was a positive spin that was there. So I feel like yeah. we should probably tap that up. It's, you know, obviously salty to say. Yeah. But... <laughs> Bring it back to reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, did you, oh, yeah. so the worst, have you guys done green flags? I assume you guys have done green flags, right? Yeah. I, know, I heard it was Yeah, terrible. they're not great for the air guys, for sure. But the army dudes, like that's their, I mean, from what I understand, at least the one we went to, like three dudes died like on the ground. So it's like a full up, like, oh, I mean, it's like a life threatening event for a lot of them. And also there's like 10,000 of them, so. But like when we were there, I think some yeah. truck Humvee rolled or something and killed, you know, and three of them died. So it was it's kind of sad, but it is cool. That, but, you know, there's like two of you and then there's 10,000 army dudes like maneuvering around on the ground. You're like, this is, it's pretty full up. Like that's, that's a lot of coordination and effort that those guys are doing. And then they do it for, I think they're there for like a month, just in the middle of the desert, walking around, shooting it. I don't even know what they shoot at. But... Yeah. It's Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, yeah, talking to, uh, I talked to this captain who was in the army and it's crazy that he was like a, you know, first lieutenant or a captain and he like leads like 300 people, you know, and in the air force, you just don't do that as a fighter pilot. But he, he was talking about exactly that, like green flag, they do calculations and they're like, all right, we're going to have this many people out in the field for this many days. Like we expect real world X number of deaths. And, uh, and it's just the way they, their human capital is just allocated so differently than the Air Force, you know, which is, it's hard to, it's hard to even like understand that. Cause in the Air Force, if there was one person gets out or if there's a midair, or, you know, anything like that, it's like full stop, figure out what's going yeah. on. But yeah. It's crazy. crazy. One of the coolest things I ever did Different was worlds. in a green flag. We, uh, so it was my two ship and then they wanted us to, coordinate with Apache and Apache squadron or whatever they call, I don't know what they, they call them, like air battalion. I don't know what it was, but so we flew out. It was cool. They came and picked us up in air cap. Yeah, air cap sure. Yeah. Uh, they came in. I don't, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> sounds legit. <laughs> We're going to have to edit this little part out, but uh, <laughs> they flew us out in Blackhawks to go like March mission tapes. plan with the Apache squadron. So it was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah yeah um so we planned but the what they wanted us to do is they would have like they had like six or eight apaches i can't remember how many but they were going to be behind these hills at this we we're going to do an airfield takedown so they were gonna we were gonna like hit strategic spots with our bombs and then they were gonna pop up as soon as the bombs blew up and then like roll in with rockets and then they'd hide behind the hills because they were close and we'd drop our second set of bombs and this is all with like live bombs and they'd pop up and like lay waste with their 50 cows and rockets again or whatever. And then we'd all like take turns strafing whatever was left. And it was a rager. It was freaking awesome to see those guys just like, I mean, they're like just hovering. So we'd like fly over and you see these eight Apaches just hovering like five feet or whatever. And as soon as the weapons went off, they like popped up and it was just like from both sides, just like this wall of firepower coming down. Like, dude, those, those dudes are legit. That would be a fun job to have if like, no kidding, things were going down. Yeah. Yeah, I, I worked with some Apaches when I was doing the MC-12 thing in Afghanistan. Like one lazing for guys placing IEDs in the Apaches cleaned up that problem very quickly. But the most impressive thing I saw them do, we were supporting some Australian SAS dudes like walking up this valley. They got into a firefight and the Apaches were like 15 minutes out. They like rolled in and the amount of destruction that it was a two ship of Apaches Cost. I mean, like, hellfires are going. Is it, is it fifty cal or is it thirty? Like, what do they have? Thirty? I don't, I don't know. know what they have. I don't remember. It was destroying everything. It was. It would be a lot of fun to fly one of those. Yeah. Flip side is, you know, you're down low, and I think they tend to get shot by like surface air or yeah, solar fire weapons. Yeah, that's not but, ideal. Yeah. I mean, even like AK 47s You know, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're that's... they are in and amongst yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Where you where you chaff off the uh, you know small arms man pads part uh, of the brief, so you have to pay yeah. 
pay attention yeah. to that. And Apache, yeah. especially black. My guess is they don't think about well, like, they chaff off SA like the... yeah. <laughs> they don't yeah, care. exactly. Because <laughs> they're like, oh, I'm getting shot, and they just land. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, oh, yeah. not a problem anymore. That's funny. Also, yeah, you say that because one of our pets just went to Sam U at uh, in Huntsville, Alabama. I guess that's where they have like the legit mystic dudes who teach the academics. And so the first four days were like long range Sam's, long range Sam's, medium range Sam's, some other. And then the last day, the last half of the last day was like, you know, the shoulder fired man pads or whatever. But they had Army Intel and Apache patches, whatever their equivalent is. They were there the entire week, just like, <laughs> like not caring. And then they fought like the last half of the last day. They finally like, like, tell us all about this or whatever. He was like, it, and it was pretty funny. They spent, they spent the entire week just listening to this. Like, what are the jamming effects on SA21 and all this? And like, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was, uh, that's, I went to a warfighter in uh, Savannah where like Raytheon brings all their engineers and, uh, you know, tells you about like the AIM 120 and the AIM 9 and stuff. And it's like, was it i think it's friday yeah friday afternoon class is the aim nine mic and uh i was like yeah i'm not gonna go to that like that's uh that's about as bad as uh aim nine gets yeah i'm not worried about it so um <laughs> if i'm shooting an aim nine mic i don't know it's just it's all i've expended all options at this point and uh see what happens yeah just give me another acm ipod so at least i track I'd rather have that. Oh, although I'll say our like uh, West up, we went for the missile shoot. I got to shoot a AIM-120 Delta, which was cool. I mean, it was cool for like three seconds. You're like, well, I don't see it anymore. But it was cool to be able to do that. <laughs> but we had a lot of nine mics. And I think we went home with like seven guys not getting to shoot because they kept spearing the drone with the nine mic. I mean, it was just out there slaying all day long. And they're like... <laughs> Like if you guys, this like this is the last drone. Like if this one <laughs> gets hit, like if it doesn't flare it off or whatever, like that's it. That's all you got. We have no more drones. So, like seven dudes seeing a shoot missiles. Oh, See, I my squadron must have gone after when you went because their their new tactic by the time I went was they turn the drone and they're like whether you are inside of the range of your missile, shoot the missile. Like, so you like the drones driving at you and you're like, oh yeah, just any, a little bit more. And he's going to be right there. And then they turn the drone and they're like, just shoot, just shoot the missile. Like, <laughs> if, if you don't shoot, you did, we have to have EOD blow these things up. So I was like, I don't care. Like send it. So yeah, like outside the nine mics, like effective range. And I was like, whatever, it doesn't matter. But yeah, I shot a shot. That's a nine cool. mic. I've only shot harm. I've yeah, did you guys shot get a shoot? Air air. Harm is cool, but. Yeah. Harmony Did you good. shoot a Maverick? I, sh I don't think I have shot a Maverick. I didn't. Captive carried. That's it. Yeah. Maverick was because we captive carried in Misawa. And then when I got to McIntyre, I got to shoot a, a nine mic and then shot a Maverick. And that was pretty cool. It comes off the rail slow. You know how the harm was like, yeah. like out of there? It was like pickle. Oh, no. And then by the time you turn to the missile, it's like like off your wing it looks like the space shuttle is taking off and like i check left because it flies like 0.4 so oh, i geez. like pull the power and i'm like a beam the maverick until it like dips over down to the target i was like sweet that's that was cool uh were you yeah. did you do the harm shoot in guam Vader? when we the one that dex planned i think you did it yeah the plan was yeah. And you can fill me in if I'm wrong. But I pre it was like seven out on the leading edge we're going to shoot, and then seven like in 10 miles trail we're going to shoot after they shot on this one emitter. And the idea was that we yeah. shoot in the harm flight profile. It's supposed to go, you know, it's supposed to go up until it reaches its range or whatever. And nobody, for whatever reason, like thought about the ranges that we were going to shoot at. So the first guys like shoot, I'm in the first wave, and I like shoot the thing. I'm like this is gonna be sick it's just gonna be like off the rail and like up but it goes like straight down at the because we're so close to it i'm like oh crap because there's yeah. seven jets right behind me who are about to rip off their harm and the plan was for us to like shoot and then like just go out low and turn around as so it's gonna be like seven crossing seven as their <laughs> harms like flying past the first seven i'm like this is terrible so i think all of us basically went to the surface like please don't get hit please don't get hit it was a good yeah good i shot, think we i think we like aborted our pass yeah the, i think we because i was in the uh, second group 
Uh, I was like on Dexter's wing and, uh, yeah. Cause it was like, you know, we see everybody out low and we're like, Oh geez. And then like, you know, <laughs> the emitters off air and we're like, Oh, what are we going to do? <laughs> yeah. And it's like, shoot them anyway. And then same thing, like right under the nose. And you're like, Oh, that is gone. Hopefully no you know, there. But yeah. That, yeah. But that was, that was, was sweet. sweet. That was a, a good time. Yeah. I wish I, the one thing that, I mean, I just wish I could shoot harms and combat. That'd be, that'd be so sick. F-35s don't carry them, but maybe yeah. one day wow. we'll, I mean, they strapped them on MiG-29, so maybe we'll figure out a way to strap them on some F-35s. There you go. The, uh, I had like the, I had the ultimate like story, just like top rope. Uh, I was, when I was at McIntyre, cause those dudes are mustard. I mean, they've been around I was talking to one of the dudes and we were just kind of, you know, sharing stories like this. And, um, somebody asked if I'd shot a harm. I was like, yeah, I shot a harm. It was at Guam. And, uh, I was like, I want to, same thing. I want to shoot one like real far. Like I want to see it go. And one of the guys was like, oh, I got to do one of those. I was like, oh man, like that's gotta be like a lot of coordination to get a harm shot that goes like way up in the bozo sphere. Uh, and I was like, where'd you do it? And he was like, Kosovo. And I was like, good, 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 good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you exactly. Win. I was like, shoot, that's yeah, exactly. So I was like, well, that's good. I'm glad some people have those. Stories. Yeah, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Bender Miller, what didn't he or was it Freak Casey? So one of those two has like the most harms shot in combat, I think, because of Kosovo. Being oh, Kosovo wow. wingman when they're just like sniper this, sniper that. And like every story they're just shooting too harm and going yeah. back and landing and going back out the next day. Wow. Yeah, the trade-off with that is someone's shooting back at you most likely. Yeah, worth mm -hmm. it. Worth well, that, it. With the telephone pole, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that was Bender Miller. That was his. Like, he, he like, literally glib two yeah. off, SA3, like, uh, right? Sam. Yeah. And, yeah, and it was, like, whew. He also, hardcore. on one of his sorties, I don't know how many air-to-air -air kills there were, but there weren't very many even in Kosovo, but he was the wingman, and he, he was, like, it was the only time in the entire war where I had like essay on what they were saying, like on the, the fight frequency or whatever. So he hears them, like these eagles are starting to declare this, like they're declaring this contact off their nose, like 20 miles or whatever. And he's like listening and they're not responding. So they're like, declare whatever. They're not responding. And as soon as uh, he, they like get within like 10 miles of this thing, he can, it's at night. So he, he like sees the shadow and they like cross over the shadow and they're like, Hostile MiG-29, like, as they pass over, and then the Eagles shoot it down, like, <laughs> like 20 miles behind them. He's like, ah, like, my one chance at a freaking air-to-air -air kill. <laughs> like, I visually watched him pass over. He didn't get a kill. Oh, man. Uh, oh, man. Whew. That's, I mean, that's some wild stuff, you know, like, talking about going to Iraq and Syria and all that, and it's, like, different, different wars, you know. For sure. Yeah. Has a whole, whole different problem set. Yeah. All right. Well, I got to get going, boys. This has been awesome. The, uh, well, we'll get all this content out to everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Rain, do you want to do a, uh, a sign us out if you're interested? I do not. I'm actually not interested in doing that at all. But no, <laughs> thanks for everyone listening. Yeah. I, I mean, I've gotten a lot of feedback on my podcast that people, it's, this is a different format from most of mine. Uh, they just like, you know, Hearing people talk. And maybe after this might be the one that breaks the camel's back. Straw breaks the camel's back. I'm like, you guys don't do that anymore. That was absolutely terrible. So, yeah. Thanks for making this happen. Again, technology, Japan, California, Utah. I mean, look at us now. Who would have thought so many years ago we'd be doing a podcast across the globe? So, that's all I got. 